Hi, welcome to another video here on An Englishman in the Balkans. I'm David and this week we're catching up with uh, the funky gorilla. Uh, we're in Gradishka, it's on the tip top northern part of the border of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, I've caught up with Predrag Borijevic, who's one of the founders, in the store that is just about to close. And uh, it's closing for a reason and it's not a negative one. Predrag, um, today I want to talk about um, the backstory, all the details about Funky Gorilla. First of all, in the store here, there's nobody because I believe this is a quantum change for the, for the operation, that it's no longer going to be open to the public. So, first of all, before we go into talk about the history of Funky Gorilla, why are we stood today in a rather empty store in a way? Well, it is. It's true. Uh, we have closed our first retail store after two years uh, of operation. Uh, it's one chapter closed and we are ready to open a new one. We're going to find out about the new chapter in just a minute, but let's go right, right back to the start. When did the idea for Funky Gorilla first come to life? Well, the idea first came to life in about 2013. Uh, and the background story is very much related to the NGO, uh, which uh, we have established here in Gradishka, which is called uh, Association Most, uh, where we worked mostly with young people uh, as of the very beginning. So in 2013, uh, we were working with the municipality of Gradishka on uh, youth policy. We did a rather big research on the needs and, and, and the way young people think generally in Gradishka. Uh, we had a rather big survey uh, with 930 uh, people interviewed and 73% uh, of them identified unemployment as uh, their main problem. So. Uh, we were thinking, you know, how can we how can we tackle it? We are a small NGO uh, in a small town in, in north of Bosnia. What can we do to to kind of change uh, change that with limited resources, with uh, no capital whatsoever? Uh, how can we just try and scratch the surface? And so we were thinking we can maybe talk about entrepreneurship, we can have different workshops, we can motivate young people, but it will be kind of meaningless because we will be talking about something that we never been through. So how can we transfer a good message if we are not talking on the basis of our experience? And usually that's kind of recognizable. When you just speak in theory, we have witnessed it in Bosnia quite a lot, you know, different theories, they function well, but when you try to implement, they usually, they usually fail. Uh, so we said, okay, let's, let's do something on our own. Let's establish a business. Let's try to make uh, a product, which we can actually feel, which is real in real time. Let's make a product, let's place it on the market and brand it. Uh, to have that added value and uh, see if it's doable. And in the meantime, in the process, we will be uh, working on education, but we will also be going through the same process as we will be offering to the young people in Ingradishka. And uh, we had that idea in, in 2013. Uh, we applied for uh, a grant funds for from uh, Youth Employment Project in Bosnia, which is financed by uh, Swiss Development Corporation, SDC. And in 2014, we received a grant to pilot our, our idea. And we were, of course, very optimistic, very eager to do it. You know, it's so easy. It will all go smoothly. Yeah. And uh, first we said, okay, we will be in the textile business because we have the know-how here in Gradishka, uh, the investment uh, to start a production facility regarding uh, clothing production is, is not that high. So it's doable with, uh, with less amount of, of initial capital. 
And there are not that many brands, local brands and, and Bosnian brands present in, in the country. Uh, so we decided to go with uh, manufacturing clothing and developing our, our own brand. Of course, we had absolutely no idea about textile industry, about how to produce clothing. Uh, so at the very beginning, we faced, you know, different challenges. Okay, which machines do we need? So we need to go and talk with suppliers. We need to go buy certain machines, but we don't know which ones. So we had some funny situations and went back home, studied, 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 uh, talked with uh, different people and just trying to put all of the pieces of the puzzle together. How many people were doing this? Because, you know, surely it, it wasn't just you, was it? Two. <laughs> two? <laughs> two of us, yeah. <laughs> uh, me and my friend Igor, uh, we still work together. He's still a part of most. Uh, it was just the two of us trying to figure out how, how to implement this idea into reality. And uh, slowly, we were lucky to identify people who would, who would join us. And we got... Uh, people who know, engineers who know how to create uh, uh, new products. Uh, we got textile designers who would join the team and, and present their designs. Uh, we got uh, local people who would do the maintenance of, of the equipment. Uh, we received several contacts with suppliers uh, uh, from repro material to, to machines that we need, to sewing threads, to, I don't know, labels, etc., etc. So slowly we began putting the pieces of the puzzle together. Were you worried, scared, or even terrified during this, this initial phase? Uh, it's, it's a roller coaster. It's a roller coaster. One day you're absolutely, you know, positive, excited. The next day you want to cry thinking, wow, can I actually do it? Why did I even start this? So it's excitement and fear, excitement and fear. But I think it's, it's a normal thing when starting something absolutely new, brand new, that you don't know where it's going to end up. So it's that mix of happiness, excitement and fear at the same time. You know, here in Bosnia, there's, yeah, I mean, yes, there are successful businesses, but you, there are not many that you can hold flags up and, and wave about it. And sometimes I have the feeling that that um, deficit, if you like, of experience is one of the biggest obstacles here. I mean, how many people were you actually able to go that had experience to say, hey, look, I'm going through this, what's your advice? Or, or were you really like on a desert island? Well, not really. We had, we had uh, uh, in a way, support from, from the local community. Primarily, uh, you know, friends, people who are close to you, who have their own business, either it's a small scale business or maybe a business that employs 10, 15, 20 people. But they were, they were supportive. They were supportive in, in terms of certain recommendations, you know, pay attention to this, pay attention to that. So we had support. Uh, but, of course, that support is just maybe an advice or uh, a general direction where to go. Uh, but in the end, it's, it's up to the people who are actually starting a business to go through that path. Of course, there's a lot of bumps on the road. And uh, we managed to establish a production facility. We had everything in place. We were in a way, organizing non-formal education for uh, primarily young women from rural areas uh, to get that know-how, how to create, how to create a business, uh, how to create a business and, and how to actually work in the textile industry. And we said, okay, we will have education for maybe 15 uh, to 20 people. Uh, we will provide uh, the know-how to them we will keep some of them because we don't have the capacity to employ 50 or 20 people. And we will try and, and, and uh, raise their employability skills and then recommend them to other companies. So like capacity building for, for the local community. I mean, that if, if somebody else has got something similar, then you've already provided them with a, 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 a trained work, yes. work base. Yes, that was, that was also the general idea. Uh, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of people went through uh, those uh, educational activities in our company, even 
after we established and uh, the ones who were who were good were able to find to find employment in other companies as well so you've got this clothing company uh, you've trained people up at this stage do you have this wonderful store do you have uh, all the infrastructure ready to go no no we had uh, we had an online shop set up so when we established the company it took us about two months to uh, develop our first products to produce them to have something in stock and then we launched our web store thinking oh, it's the best web store in the world you know it came from the heart it will go wonderful you know but first you know three or four or five days it went absolutely amazing uh, but then we ran out of friends and family who would be buying it. <laughs> but friends and family are important, right? Friends and family are very, very important for that first step to give you the boost and then reality kicks in. Uh, so then we were like, okay, after one or two months of the, the web store being present, maybe we are not getting to that break-even point. If we continue like this, we are in a, we are in a trouble maybe. And, of course, that's when that reality kicks in. We came from the NGO sector, where pretty much all the services that we provide are free of charge. We work for the community and with the community. And now we find ourselves in, in a different position. We have a product to sell. So selling something and offering something for free uh, are two completely different mindsets. So we had to, in a way, change our mindset to be business oriented, but also preserve that uh, social social aspect that we cherish so much and that we uh, always focus on. Did you find that 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 change difficult? Uh, I think yes, because it took us it took me personally almost two years to <laughs> to actually overcome it. From being a provider of services to the community, which NGOs are, are basically there for, to being a businessman, would I be right in saying that you then s most probably feel a sense of selfishness in a way because you have a product and it has to be market-driven? Well, it's not, a sel it's not selfishness. I would say I'm, I'm a, a divider personality, uh, depending which role I have to take at the moment. Uh, because problem with being on the market is that you depend solely on on the sales, on your, in a way, income from, from selling the services and products you make. Uh, without it, we cannot preserve jobs, we cannot invest in new products, uh, it will all collapse. So it's a necessity. It's a necessity that we need to, that we need to have. And it took us, me a lot of time to, to accept it and also to be confident enough that the product we are making is actually of good quality and that it has a certain, a certain price. Uh, so now I think I have mastered it. Of course, there's a long way to go and, and, and the learning process in, in business never stops. And in any business, be it NGO, be it for-profit, non-profit, the learning process has to be present always. And we are still trying to develop and, and, and to develop our mindset, to develop the team, to develop everything. And I think being in that role where you have to be for-profit oriented on one side and non-profit oriented on the other side is, is very challenging. If we go back to the to the, the, the so the first stab is let's let's get this web store. How difficult was it to do? I mean, it, you know, this postage, especially if people are buying internationally, um, that is a problem here in Bosnia Herzegovina. Taking other currencies, mm -hmm. um, it must have been a bit of a nightmare. But you obviously seem to overcome it somehow initially. Yeah, it was it was a nightmare. The logistic process, how to deliver. Uh, uh, Delivering internationally, we thought, okay, we're just going to start with Bosnia, and then after several months, we'll go international. Uh, it didn't happen at all. 
uh, because sending, receiving payments and, and sending it outside of Bosnia is relatively expensive. So there is that logistical barrier present. Uh, we had requests to send to send abroad to export, but then the price of shipping and and, and the customs would be twice the size, uh, twice the price of the product itself. So for somebody buying outside, it's not really feasible, uh, and for us as well. So we kind of focused then on Bosnia and Herzegovina, delivering in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and then we explored in a way uh, the potential to offer our services to to other people and, and organizations and companies and so on. Uh, so then we said, okay, we have Funky Gorilla, we have our brand on one side, but we need something else. We need to have financial income to sustain everything because Funky Gorilla cannot, at the very beginning, produce enough income to cover all our costs. So then we said, okay, we will diversify our product portfolio or service portfolio uh, to have maybe two pillars where we can stand. So if one fails, we have this other one to, to sustain us. And so we uh, started providing also services to uh, other clients like uh, sewing services, production of custom made uh, clothing for different events, for uh, different purposes. And with that, we managed kind of to overcome uh, certain problems that we that we were facing. Uh, as I said, it was it was a process. It was a constant process of trial and error. Uh, you expect one thing, you go for it, but then it turns out to be dead end. So you have to go back, restart, start over. Then again, you hit a rather big wall, then you come back, say regroup, and so it's this. You get hit, stand up, yeah. you go down, you stand up, you go down, you stand up. It's that, that gorilla spirit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, we're here in, 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 in the store that is about to disappear as, as, as everything goes through the next phase. But if you didn't look through the window today and see the grass and the, you know, the center of Gradishka here, this could be a small store on Oxford Street in London. It really could. I mean, look at the, the decor and, and, and the way the shop is dressed. No, thank you. Um, how, how radical has it been for, for people to realize that they have what is like an amazingly international looking store um, in a small provincial town right on the northern border of Bosnia-Herzegovina? Well, uh, I think people loved it. Uh, but. Again, there's a economical mismatch uh, uh, of their ability to afford uh, more expensive clothing than, than the ones on the market, which we are facing. We want to have high quality product, which will have a higher price uh, because we want to have decent salaries in the production, uh, uh, limited quantities produced. It's something that, that's expensive. So our product is not cheap when compared to, to maybe other, other offers here in Gradishka. And with people not having uh, a lot of money, uh, a lot of ability to, to afford products, uh, we had people coming in, but the income was not uh, something that uh, is in a way sustainable in a long run. Uh, but when we said okay, we are regrouping, we are going, we are scaling up, we are in a way developing, going on the next level. We said maybe the store is, is, is too much. We will try and go wholesale and offer it to, to, different, uh, to different stores here in the city and throughout Bosnia and Herzegovina. And we had a sale. We had a lot of people coming in saying, wow, we are so sad that the store is closing, that it's it's not going to be here anymore. So from all of the feedbacks that we got, people, people love the store. Do you think the nostalgia in the future when, when everything works as to, you know, maybe dream is the wrong word, to, to your business plan, do you think it would ever come back again? Uh, I think it will. I think it will. If we succeed, if we succeed, it will definitely, it will definitely come back and it will be in a way a base for... Uh, for us to come because this was 
more than a shop to us. This was like a meeting place, uh, you know, an idea place where we would think about different things. And I think for me personally, I would love for the shop to come back to be in, in the place where Funky Gorilla started. The next phase is about wholesale. It's about scalability. Um, and I just want to talk to you about that because when I speak to, to small entrepreneurs, those that still want to go through the pain that you went through, it surely comes to every one of them that they're going to have to think about scaling up, that they can't sit in their bedroom um, making their jewellery or, or printing their, their wonderful pictures that they take on their camera or anything else. How difficult has it been to um, devise your um, scalability plan? Well, it has been, it has been difficult, uh, primarily because uh, getting an investment in Bosnia is not that common. And being investment ready is also something that requires a lot of, a lot of preparation and a clear vision where to go, uh, which is doable only if you went through that process of making mistakes and then recognizing the niche, identifying it, making a real plan, and then going for it. Uh, for us, it's, as I said, it's an involvement process. And after being in operation for almost three years now, I think we have went through that uh, birth pains and we have learned a lot of lessons. And now we have, in a way, a clearer and more realistic vision, what is doable and what is not. Uh, and we want to use our own experience to, to, in a way, advance on the market. Uh, so we want to offer Funky Gorilla products in wholesale. And we want to, again, offer services to, to other people in our companies. So we are, again, sticking to that diversified approach of creating our own brand, but developing in uh, parallel with the services that we provide to other clients. When you started with the web store, um, and most probably having dreams of exporting the Funky Gorilla brand uh, overseas and then realizing it wasn't possible then, with the wholesale um, approach, do you think you'll address the possibility of trying to get a brand from Bosnia outside the borders of Bosnia? Yes, we have already in a way plans and if all goes well maybe even next month we'll be in Maria Hilferstrasse in Vienna we will see are you saying that maybe now <laughs> uh, that, that, that the oh, the horrendous customs uh, import and export duties may be changing for the better for entrepreneurs uh, well yes regarding textile we last month we had our first export which we are very proud of. And it went well, the, the customers uh, outside Bosnia are very satisfied. Uh, so we are now pursuing that challenge of, of being also an export oriented company. And the customs, I mean, it's, it's something that has to be, it has to be done. Uh, so it's not, it's not a, an obstacle that cannot be overcome. I mean, it's, uh, it's something that's there and it's easily doable with following the right procedures and, and then there's, there's no problems of having a larger export outside. It's a problem when you have to ship, uh, when you work with, with clients outside, when you have to ship, for example, one t-shirt, but when it comes to uh, like business to business cooperation, it's, it's, not that, it's not that complicated. And I want to go back again to the start. When you started, it, you know, it sounded like you, when you had this idea, like you were flapping about in the water of, of a swimming pool, not really knowing how to swim. You now know how to swim. Is there any um, plan for the organization to give the experiences that you've got to a new generation of entrepreneurs? Because sadly, entrepreneurship isn't taught or even mentioned in most universities at the moment? Yes, well, uh, I will now switch my personality to the NGO side. <laughs> uh, we have applied for uh, a program and if successful, we will be uh, establishing a non-formal education resource center 
where we will try and provide uh, primarily non-formal education to, to young people uh, to get their skills up, uh, the skills that are needed on the market, primarily IT, uh, get their employability up. Uh, uh, so we kind of bypass that mismatch between the skills that people have after finishing their formal education and uh, the needs that the companies have for, for uh, human resources. Uh, we will try and, and offer, of course, free services uh, to try and bypass that, that gap and, and connect young people who want employment, who lack skills, and companies that need, uh, in a way, functional, functional uh, human, human capacity. And we will also offer trainings uh, when it comes to developing their own business, uh, promoting that entrepreneur entrepreneurial uh, mindset, and trying to offer something to, to young people that they can actually use. And we are also you know, we're negotiating with the local community to establish a small startup fund for, uh, for young people who are unemployed so they can also uh, in a way create their own idea, uh, get that uh, in a way motivation and know-how, but also maybe certain financial funds so they can overcome that, that financial burden which every entrepreneur faces at the very beginning of their venture. It seems that this pay it forward mentality that you have both in, in, in a commercial and in a non-commercial environment could be something that could unlock the future for the country. It could be that here in Gradishka you found the key that the international community have been looking for for over 25 years. Well. I wouldn't go that far, but... <laughs> uh, but no, no, when you, th when you think about it. Well, it's, it's something that's it's a live organism, you know, the whole ecosystem, like educational ecosystem, if we can call it like that, or an entrepreneurial ecosystem is, I would say, kind of stuck somewhere. Uh, and there needs to come from the bottom. It needs to evolve into a healthy organism. And in order to, to do it, it needs to go through various illnesses and pains so it can grow strong and, and, and organic. Because if it's, you know, if it's DNA, <laughs> if we insert something from outside and say, okay, here's the scenario, you need to do this, 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 and this, it will most likely not work. Uh, because it needs to be uh, suited to the local circumstances, which are sometimes very complicated from bureaucratical, political, economical, uh, uh, historical, etc., etc. So I think it needs to come from, from the bottom. And with the new generations of young people coming, I think it's slowly changing. And we don't know where it's going to go. It can go in a bad direction, in a good direction. We are hoping it will go in a good direction. We are trying to put good examples out uh, to motivate young people to follow a certain path. But we never know. And it's, but it's about trying. We want to share our experiences. We want to, in a way, send a message out. And we cannot order anybody to follow us, which People make mistakes when they, if, you know, if we have an idea, you must follow this idea because it's the best. That's not something I, I like to say. We say, okay, we are doing this and this. If you feel like it's something you recognize is good, feel free to follow. We are here. We are here for you. And that should be the approach that, that we take and hopefully with positive examples, if they start to multiply, then it will become, in a way, a viral effect. Today, we've been reading the first couple of chapters of the Funky Gorilla book. There are many chapters still to write and for people still to read. But seeing as you're one of the authors of it, um, how do you see the final page of the book? Huh. Well, I wouldn't... I wouldn't have the final page. 
You, or you'd be more like a Harry Potter. You'd go yeah, from you'd go from volume yeah. to volume. The volume to volume to volume. Uh, because if we set a final page, then we lose the challenge. We lose the the thrill of it. Uh, so I would leave the final page blank, and we still haven't succeeded. Uh, we still haven't succeeded. So it's and God knows if we ever will, uh, because we can set maybe certain goals, but the ultimate goal, I think, we will, will never be reached, which is, you know, having a prosperous society where we all work, uh, where we all have, in a way, that sense of social good uh, within us. So I think it's a process that will never end. Uh, so that high, higher goal is that blank page where we are striving, but it is important to go one step at a time. Uh, so. The next volume is us trying to develop it even more, uh, to try and develop the guerrilla community, which means people with, with a similar mindset that we can work together, we can cooperate, we can create good things. We can be very good at it. We can be world-class, why not? Uh, we have the know-how, we have a lot of good people who have amazing skills, and if we combine them together, if we offer something good, I think I think we can make it. But it's not something that happens overnight. It's it's a process. It's an ongoing process that will take probably years, maybe even decades. But uh, uh, persistency, as we talked earlier, is I think uh, the key to success. So that was Predrag Borievich from Funky Gorilla here in Gradishka. Um, and I think that, well I actually think that he's a social disruptor in a very, very good way. Uh, and the story of um, the Funky Gorilla will be like a JK Rowling story. You just don't know what the next chapter is going to bring. So we've been in Gradishka today. There's the bridge across the river Sava over my shoulder. Croatia's there. This is where we're here in Bosnia-Herzegovina. The next video will be next Sunday. There might be one in between, but normally Sundays at 1500 CET. And if you would like to share, like and subscribe, that'd be uh, really cool. So from a very balmy, sticky um, border, catch you next week. And then